Howdy folks, and welcome back to World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles, and yes, I know Jingles, you'll use any old excuse just to play Hearts of Oak. Um, <laughs> fair enough, you got me. But it's not just any old excuse this time, it's HMS Hood. She's finally making it into World of Warships. The first British, well, battle cruiser or battleship? Good question, and we're going to look into that in slightly more detail during the course of this video. Let's get the usual disclaimers out of the way before we go any further. Obviously, as many of you are aware, I served in the Royal Navy for 22 years, and therefore you can probably expect me to be very, very biased when it comes to looking at British ships, especially ones as famous as the Hood. And yes, that is the Bismarck in the background. Try not to read too much into that. On the other hand, you could look at my, let's call it professional bias as far as the Royal Navy is concerned, there's something of a double-edged sword for wargaming, because if they screw this one up, I am likely to be very, very annoyed. So, with my cards firmly laid out on the table right at the start of the video, let's take a closer look at this Admiral-class battle cruiser, which is appearing in World of Warships as a battleship. Huh, why is that? The Graf Spey is already in World of Warships as a cruiser, and that has battleship calibre guns. What makes the hood different? Well, it all goes back to World War I and the Battle of Jutland, where the British battle cruisers exploded in such spectacular and catastrophic fashion whenever they were hit by German battleship calibre shells. The Hood was designed as an Admiral class battle cruiser and was in fact the last battle cruiser ever built for the Royal Navy. She wasn't commissioned until 1920, and obviously the Battle of Jutland in 1916 raised a couple of questions about the armour protection on this class of ship. And so during construction, substantial amounts of extra armour were added to the Hood, which effectively turned her into a moderately well armoured, for the time, battleship and yet she was still known as a battle cruiser, which was kind of bizarre because the whole idea behind the battle cruiser concept was that you had a heavy cruiser that had enough armour to protect the ship from cruiser calibre firepower, 5 inch, 6 inch and even 8 inch shells, but packed enough firepower of its own, the hood had 8 15 inch guns, the same calibre weapons as found on the Bismarck, enough firepower of its own to utterly destroy any cruiser that was foolish enough to try to face her. Remember the Graf Spey was only armed with six 11-inch guns, and that was enough firepower to utterly wreck the British cruiser squadron that attempted to take her on outside Montevideo Harbour in 1940. The Hood has eight 15-inch guns. It would be suicidal for an even a heavy cruiser to try to take on a ship with this kind of firepower. And yet the hood was still quick, despite the extra armour that was added during construction, which had other effects which we'll go into later. But despite that extra armour, she was still rated for a top speed of 31 knots. And in fact, during her speed trials, she actually managed to achieve a speed of 32.07 knots, which is reflected in World of Warships. She has a top speed of 32 knots here in the game. Now the effect of adding all of this extra armour, well it had a couple of good effects and a couple of bad effects. First the bad effects. The Hood was a low-profile ship in the first place, her freeboard was quite close to the waterline. And with the addition of this extra armour, the freeboard became even closer to the waterline. And what that meant was that in anything other than a flat calm, the quarterdeck of this ship was almost always awash with water if it wasn't permanently submerged. This meant that living conditions on board the ship, particularly for those that lived below the level of the weather deck and in the aft half of the ship, were extremely, how can we put it, aquatic. <laughs> it was a very damp and wet ship to live in. Those damp and wet living conditions meant that the crew of the Hood suffered the highest incidences of tuberculosis of any ship in the Royal Navy. In fact, she was actually at one point nicknamed the biggest submarine in the Royal Navy. The fact that she sat so low in the water did, however, have two beneficial side effects. First, it made her a very, very stable platform for firing those eight 15-inch guns. And secondly, it meant that her vitals, her machinery spaces and her magazines were almost all submerged below the level of the waterline, and that is also reflected here in World of Warships. Let's actually take a closer look at the armour. This is the Citadel armour protection, and more importantly, the Citadel placement here on the hood. You can see that it's level with that black painted line 
along the side of the ship. That's actually known as the boot topping, and that represents where the water line of the ship should be at full load. And that coincides exactly with the top of the citadel. So the citadel of this ship is difficult to hit. It's also more difficult to penetrate because it has a turtleback armour arrangement. You see the green sections of citadel armour plating at the sides? They're angled and sloped. That's the whole idea behind a turtleback armour arrangement. The idea is that as ships get closer and closer to each other, and as the trajectory of the shells that are coming in flattens and flattens, any shots that come in through the belt armour and threaten to penetrate the citadel are going to hit that angled and sloped armour section and ricochet off. That at least is the theory. The problem is that here on the hood, those green sections of plating are only 51 millimetres thick. Turtleback armour isn't new in World Warships, not by any stretch of the imagination. There are plenty of other ships in this game that have that turtleback armour over the Citadel. The Germans are quite famous for it. Let's take a look at one of theirs. Let's pick another Tier 7 premium battleship. German this time. Where's the Scharnhorst? There she is. The Scharnhorst also has a turtleback armour arrangement. But that's 110 millimetres thick. That's more than double the thickness. You see, the Royal Navy always classified the hood as a battle cruiser, despite the fact that she was really shaping up to be more of a fast battleship. The Navy wanted her to keep that speed, and while concessions were made to armour protection in light of what happened to British battle cruisers at the Battle of Jutland, she still wasn't really heavily armoured enough to properly call herself a battleship, but that's alright because nobody was calling her a battleship. Certainly nobody in the Royal Navy was calling her a battleship. They insisted she was still a battle cruiser. She had battleship guns, she had cruiser speed, she's a battle cruiser, not a fast battleship. And she was certainly the most heavily armoured battle cruiser in the world. In fact, when she was commissioned, she was the largest warship afloat, a title that she retained for the next 20 years. You see, the problem with the hood was that she was designed to survive the Battle of Jutland, which is understandable given the loss of so many British battle cruisers in that battle. The Admiralty wanted to make certain that such a thing would not happen to the hood. The problem was that weapons technology had moved on since the Battle of Jutland. Just as one example of the sort of thing I'm talking about, the deck armour of the hood would have stood up very, very well to hits from battleship calibre armour-piercing shells during the Battle of Jutland. The top layer of deck armour would have detonated the fuse of the shell, the second layer of deck armour would have absorbed most of the impact of the shell, and the third and final layer of deck armour should, in theory, stop the rest of the shell cold. And that would have been fine at the Battle of Jutland when everybody was firing contact-fused armour-piercing shells at each other. But by the end of World War I in 1918, significant advances had been made in time-delayed armour-piercing fused shells. And that was in 1918, and the Hood was commissioned in 1920. Now, if you were to fire a time-delayed armour-piercing fused shell at the hood at extreme range, so it comes in as plunging fire and penetrates the deck, what is likely to happen with that kind of armour arrangement is that the shell is very likely to punch clean through all three of those weak layers of armour before the fuse arms itself, and that's going to cause you all kinds of problems if what's on the other side of those three weak layers of armour doesn't react very well to explosions. The other problem that the hood had, and this wasn't specific to the hood, it was endemic across the whole of the Royal Navy. And it was to do with the way the captains of big ships were selected. You see, in order to earn your ticket as the captain of a big warship, you first had to serve as the executive officer of a big warship. The XO of a warship has many responsibilities. He's responsible for discipline on board the ship. It's not a job guaranteed to earn you popularity. He's also responsible for all aspects of seamanship on board the ship. And he's also responsible for how good the ship looks, how clean the ship is, how well presented and well painted the ship is. You see, there are certain advantages that go with having a navy that's bigger and more powerful than your next two nearest competitors combined. The first advantage of that is that very few people are foolish enough to try to fight you. And so the Royal Navy had gotten by in its reputation and its size for something like 200 years, with a couple of brief but very violent intervals, the First World War being one of them. And since the Royal Navy had, to all intents and purposes, pretty much been a peacetime navy for the previous 200 years, 
so there wasn't a huge amount of actual combat experience upon which to judge executive officers for selection to promotion to captain. So if you can't judge an executive officer on his combat performance, what can you judge him on? Well, what's he responsible for? Discipline, seamanship and cleanliness. Now this is going to sound completely ridiculous, but I guarantee you it is 100% true. For the majority of the 19th century, the single biggest criteria upon which an executive officer of a big warship in the Royal Navy was judged in order to ascertain his suitability for promotion to captain was how smart and good looking a ship he kept. It sounds ridiculous, hell it is ridiculous, but it does make a certain amount of sense because most of what the Royal Navy did during the 18th century was sail around the world impressing the locals with how smart and big our ships looked. It was not unusual for the executive officer of a British warship to dig into his own pocket and spend his own money to have his ship repainted whenever his promotion report was due and a big inspection was coming up. And if there was one thing that a ship's executive officer dreaded above all else, it was gunnery training, because nothing messed up the paintwork on the ship like firing those big guns. You know, the things that the ships were designed for in the first place. And so, because of this completely ludicrous system of assessing the suitability of executive officers for promotion to captain, you ended up with a whole bunch of commanding officers of major surface competence that had very little experience of ever actually firing the guns of their ship in training, let alone in combat. And that's absolutely fine as long as you're in a peacetime navy. But then the First World War happened, and at the outbreak of war, the standard of gunnery in the Royal Navy was deplorably bad. So bad, in fact, that certain procedures were implemented in order to compensate for the inaccuracy of British shooting. The theory being, throw enough shit at the wall, some of it's going to stick. Rate of fire was emphasised over accuracy. And in order to increase the rate of fire, you pretty much have to take certain shortcuts. Shortcuts like leaving flash doors open between magazines and weapon ammunition hoists. Things like stacking bags of cordite in flats, companionways and passageways. Things that have predictably catastrophic results if you're in a thinly armoured battlecruiser and you get hit by a German battleship calibre shell. Particularly if you're in a battlecruiser that has deck armour designed to survive being shot at by contact-fused armour-piercing shells of the Jutland era, and instead it's World War II and the Bismarck's firing at you with delayed action-fused 15-inch armour-piercing shells. And that is supposed to be what happened to the hood. Nobody's really sure, but it's the most likely explanation. During the Battle of the Denmark Strait in 1941, she was hit by the Bismarck's 5th salvo, which detonated her rear magazine, broke the ship in two, and she sank in three minutes with only three survivors. Ordinary signalman Ted Briggs, able seaman Robert Tilburn, and midshipman William John Dundas. I actually have a photograph framed of the hood, signed by signalman Ted Briggs. So, history lesson over, what can you expect of HMS Hood here in World Warships? My initial impressions of this ship were distinctly underwhelming. It wasn't that there was anything specifically bad about the ship. Well, there was, actually. Its anti-aircraft fire was absolutely terrible. Um, which was surprising, because that's supposed to be the area in which the hood is different from all of the other battleships in World of Warships. You see, the hood gets access to the defensive fire consumable, the anti-aircraft consumable. Which is surprising, because its anti-aircraft firepower was pretty mediocre. Or it was... You see, the hood's gone through a couple of changes based on feedback from playtesters, and while it was a distinctly mediocre ship before, with a very, very underwhelming anti-aircraft defensive firepower, even using the defensive fire cooldown, now, you know, it's not bad. It's actually quite tanky. And the defensive fire is very, very interesting, because it's not just the only battleship in World of Warships to get the defensive fire cooldown, None of the cruisers in World Warships get a defensive fire cooldown like this thing. You see, the first time I played the Hood, it was before all of the changes and buffs that had been delivered to the ship. And as is usual when you're playtesting a brand new ship, everybody suddenly gets afflicted by new ship syndrome. And they all want to be the one to score the hits on and hopefully sink the new ship. Foremost amongst them was the enemy Tier 7 aircraft carrier, was a Japanese Hiryu. 
Now I'm sitting there in a battleship with a defensive fire cooldown and I'm just praying for the enemy carrier to make me a priority target and of course he did so in came his dive bombers and his torpedo bombers and I pressed that defensive fire cooldown and then I ate a bunch of bombs <laughs> and I got torpedoed and that was pretty much the end of that game. He lost some of his dive bombers and torpedo bombers but it did not stop the strike getting through. Well that's all changed. You see, what's special about the Hood's anti-aircraft firepower, and what wasn't special about it before, is the fact that in addition to a whole bunch of quad-mounted 50 caliber machine guns, 40mm pom-poms, the secondaries, which are 100mm guns, also double up as dual-purpose anti-aircraft guns, but it's also got these things that go by the unlikely title of unrotated projectile launchers, which is a fancy way of saying rocket launchers that have a steel cable, a parachute, and a mine. The idea, and it wasn't a successful idea by the way, it really didn't work, was that these rockets would all launch a whole bunch of cables into the air. At the top end of the cable would be a parachute, so the cable is now dangling in the air, hopefully in the path of incoming bombers. The cable would snag over the wings, would be drawn up over the wing of the aircraft, and at the other end of the cable is an aerial mine, which would blow the wing off. Didn't work in practice, terrible idea, but that's what the Hood was equipped with. Now, on paper, these things aren't that great in World of Warships either. It has five of them. They have a range of 1.5 kilometers, so they are self-defense weapons only, and they only have 50 damage per minute. But when you trigger that defensive fire cooldown, the Hood's short-range rocket launchers have their DPM buffed by a factor of 25. Yes, really. That, yes, that is a lot. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's the point. You see, it wasn't like that before. Dive bombers would still get through. You'd shoot some of them down on the way back, but at that point the damage had already been done. You press that defensive fire button and suddenly those rocket launchers have 1250 damage per minute by themselves. And you've got five of them. <laughs> <laughs> The one thing that the defensive fire cooldown does not do is affect any of the other anti-aircraft guns. So it doesn't affect the 50 caliber machine guns, doesn't affect the 40 mm pom-poms, doesn't affect the 100 mm secondaries. But when you've got five of these UP rocket launchers each spitting out 1250 damage per minute, you don't really need to buff the others. You can, of course, buff that even further by picking the relevant crew skills and equipment fits. These are larger than 85mm rockets, so they get the full benefit from manual control for anti-aircraft fire. So now we're talking nearly 3,000 <laughs> damage per minute on these anti-aircraft rockets. And with the relevant equipment modules, you can get the range up to 2.2 kilometers. Now that is still short range, but that's just suicide for any dive bomber that tries to penetrate your defensive fire envelope. What it's not going to do is protect you from torpedo bombers. Well, it might at first, because carrier players do like to drop their torpedoes at the last possible moment in order to give you the minimum amount of time to evade. But once word gets around about the Hood short-range anti-aircraft fire, you're going to find that carrier players start standing off just a little with their torpedo bombers and not bothering to waste their dive bombers on you. And the Hood is a very, very big target. Remember, when she was launched, she was the largest warship in the world, a title that she held for 20 years. The ship has a 910 meter turning circle. Y yes, that is a lot. The rudder shift time is not bad. I've managed to get it down to 10.2 seconds by fitting the rudder module. And I definitely recommend the rudder module on this ship because when you've got a target as big as this, and there are torpedo bombers and destroyers around, you want every bit of help possible in getting the nose of this ship turned in towards a suspected or confirmed threat. And that was one of the other issues that I had with the Hood when I first started playing it, just how slow and ponderous it was. At times it felt like you were sailing a Nagato or a Fuso, but that doesn't really seem to be the case anymore. Rudder shift time of 10.2 seconds, perfectly acceptable on a battleship, and it seems to respond to rudder commands much, much better than I remember it doing when I first started playing it. It's certainly no destroyer, but you no longer feel like you're at the mercy of an unexpected torpedo launch because you just can't get the ship turned in time. You're still likely to get some nasty surprises if you find yourself getting bounced at close range by one or more destroyers, 
particularly because the secondaries on the hood, they're pretty bad. It has seven double-barreled 102mm gun turrets, and they're not very good. I found myself in a close range, broadside on secondary gun battle duel with a Nagato at one point while I was playing this ship, and those secondaries at a range of 200 meters did the grand total of just under 900 damage. I do not recommend fitting equipment or selecting crew skills that buff the secondaries of this ship because, well, you can't polish a turd. The main battery guns on the hood, however, they're not bad. They're certainly not great, but they're not bad. They have a range of 18.6 kilometers, which is all right. They have a fairly disappointing initial shell velocity, though. It's only 731.5 meters per second. It's got eight 15-inch guns, and the high explosive shells are actually very good, although I've never actually fired them, but they have a 34% chance of fire on targets, and they do 5,300 average damage. That's not bad. In fact, it's actually pretty good. The armor-piercing shells seem to be a bit of a mixed bag. I don't know the exact stats and details of the penetration values of the 15-inch armor-piercing, but I do notice a... well, an uncomfortable number of armor-piercing shatters on even broadside target battleships. I don't have a problem with the accuracy. This is not one of those battleships where you regularly find yourself cursing as you unleash a broadside volley at the target and shots go long, shots go short, and nothing actually hits the target. The guns have 225 meters of dispersion at the maximum range of 18.6 kilometers, which is fine. The Sigma values seem fine. I don't really have issues hitting the target. It's the number of shatters, which isn't excessive, but it seems... Well, it just seems like more of these 15-inch shells are shattering on targets than they should. At close range, however, you do not get that problem. At close range, these 15-inch guns are brutal. The problem is that you don't really want to be fighting anything at close range in the hood. And when I say close range, I'm talking ranges of, well, less than five kilometers. Not if you can possibly help it. And that's for a number of reasons. One, if you're getting close to something that has torpedoes, you're a huge target. Two, your secondaries are terrible. You're not going to kill anything with the secondaries. Three, unlike the actual HMS hood, the one that you have here in the game does not have torpedoes. The hood actually had uh, yep, six torpedo launchers, three on each side. They were terrible, of course. <laughs> I mean, they were really, really bad. Um, I'm trying to remember the numbers. The torpedoes could either be fired at a speed of 25 knots, yes, really, that slow, and then they had a range of, I think, just over 10 kilometers, or they could be fired at a speed of... 40 knots, which is still terrible, and then they only had a range of just under 5 kilometers. But you couldn't aim them. Well, you could, but you had to turn the ship to aim the torpedoes, and I suspect that's the reason why we don't have them here in World of Warships. I mean, I don't know how hard that would have been to model, but no torpedoes on the hood here in the game. But the biggest reason why you really don't want to be getting this ship into a close-range brawl, unless you have no option but to do so, is because it takes 60 seconds for the turrets to rotate 180 degrees. Now, if you go for the Tier 2 Expert Marksman skill, you can get that turret rotation speed down to just over 48 seconds, which is better, but, you know, it's still 48 seconds. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, these turrets do take a while to turn around which can be a problem if you're trying to circle another battleship at close range and keep these turrets pointed at the target. It is very, very difficult to do so. Back to the game for the moment. You can see that, well, our base is being capped. And this is one of the things that the hood is exceptionally good at, responding quickly to threats exactly like this. With that top speed of 32 knots, you can get from one end of the map to the other in a very, very short period of time. Unfortunately for me, now that I'm here, as well as the battleship and pair of cruisers that were over there, there's also a kamikaze sitting inside the cap circle. Now, I did spot him earlier. He got overflown by torpedo bombers from our carrier. So when you was there, got the bows of the ship turned in and avoided his first salvo of torpedoes. But now that he's missed me with the torpedoes, he's making himself scarce. He's blown his smoke and he's popping in and out of visibility. But having just fired his torpedoes, he is not an immediate threat. 
So it's time to do some damage to this Geniser now. Now, he's not targeting me, which is fantastic news. I'm detected, but nobody's actually aiming at me, which is a highly unusual circumstance when you're testing a new ship. Shots out with the 15-inch guns, and it looks like our two Geniser now are going to... They're going to torpedo each other. Fire the rear turrets. Yep, he dies to torpedo attack before the shots can land on target and finish him off. And yep, the two Geniser now is torpedo each other. Now... I'm detected by aircraft. I cannot see the kamikaze, but I'm detected by aircraft, so I know he can see me. And he's probably reloaded his torpedoes by now, so once again, get the nose of this ship turned around, because I have to expect torpedoes to be heading in my direction. Yep, there they are. You see, it's not hard, is it? Even in a ship with a 910 meter turning circle, there he is. <laughs> he's got bad news, there's a Leander closing in from the other side. Enemy carrier also trying to torpedo me, trigger the defensive fire cooldown, scatter the torpedo drop, ease back on the throttle and just slide in the gap between the two torpedoes as the kamikaze realises he's about to die <laughs> as the Leander closes in and finishes him off at point blank range. So, cap defended, four enemy ships remaining against six of ours and we can see where the three battleships are and the carrier's probably somewhere or all the way over on the other side of the map as well. Now, in this kind of situation, if you were in nearly every other battleship in the game, at this point you may as well break out a deck of cards, because there'd be very little else that you could do to influence the outcome, at least in time, to make a difference. Right now I've got a very narrow window to squeeze a couple of shots off of that Scharnhorst. As, oh wait, I think they rammed each other. <laughs> okay. But that's it. Anything else that I could be shooting at right now is either out of line of fire because there's a dirty great big mountain in the way, or it's undetected because it's a carrier and it's hiding behind an island 30 kilometers away. But I'm in the hood. I have a top speed of 32 knots. I can actually get over there in time. And when I say in time, I mean in time to actually be useful, not just in time to get there, the last one left alive on my team, and have them all feast on my tears as I arrive with nobody to back up and support and two or three battleships shooting at me, which would normally be the case in another battleship, because you're just not fast enough. Now, I'm fast, but I'm not that fast. I mean, I certainly don't have the time to go detouring all the way around the islands here, but I'm on Two Brothers. There's a very nice little channel. Now, it's risky, but I have this defensive fire cooldown, so I don't really have to worry too much about air attack. Even torpedo bombers are going to have to get very, very close in order to get a successful drop-off against me down this channel. And very, very close is where the hoods at the aircraft shines. So it's definitely worth taking the risk. One thing that I haven't actually mentioned yet, and which is very, very important, and you might be confused because earlier on I was saying the hood is actually quite a tanky ship, and yet earlier on I was also complaining about the relatively thin armour for a battleship. I mean, the hood has up to 381mm of armour, but none of that is protecting the Citadel. The turrets and the turret casements are 381 millimeters of armor, as is, I think, the bridge conning tower. But everywhere else, not so much. Now, what makes the hood tanky is the fact that the citadel is below the level of the waterline, and the fantastic firing arcs of those 15-inch gun turrets, both ahead and to the rear. I've just fired the two front turrets. Now, I'm going to swing the ship around and bring the rear turrets to bear. I'm okay at the moment, because... I'm detected, but nobody is actually pointing their guns at me yet. These guys have just seen me, and they're now panicking, and one of them has at least selected me as a target, but so far, neither of them have their guns pointed at me. And that is, in fact, that's probably a little bit too much. I didn't even need to swing the ship around as much as I did in order to bring the two rear gun turrets to bear on a target to my front. And you have exactly the same amount of clearance with the forward gun turrets when you're firing at a target to the rear. That's great news if you're trying to disengage from a superior force. Not only are you likely to be faster than them, because you've got a top speed of 32 knots, but you're also able to keep the ship effectively armour-angled while still firing at them with all eight of your 15-inch guns. Furthermore, you can't really see it right now, but this ship has a very cute arse. It's not like one of those American battleships with their big, fat, square backsides. It actually has a very well-shaped and angled stern. Now, oh crap. Torpedo bomb is coming in, and my defensive fire is not quite ready to go. Credit to the enemy carrier, he did time that very, very well. 
Oh well, I'm going to eat one of those torpedoes, but eh, that's alright. I'll take it on the torpedo bulge so there shouldn't be any flooding. Defensive fire is up. I am going to shred those dive bombers. None of those dive bombers is going to land a hit or make it out of here alive. Forward turrets, ready to go and organize now. Absorb his incoming fire. I'm aiming for the bows and two penetrations, but didn't penetrate the citadel. I think he knows he's dead unless he does something drastic. And so he's turning and he's going to give me a shot with the rear turrets and I don't have to swing the back of the ship out much in order to get the rear turrets firing at a target dead ahead and he has to be launching his torpedoes at me. There's no other reason for him to commit suicide like that. So start speeding up, start turning in towards him, but it was a pretty well aimed torpedo spread. I think he anticipated I was going to start turning the nose in. So I take one of the torpedoes, but again I take it on the torpedo bulge so there's no flooding and there's just the enemy carrier left. I do actually like the hood. I really didn't at first. I mean, it wasn't bad, but it was deeply mediocre. There was absolutely nothing special about it. The defensive fire was just a gimmick. It didn't really work. Um, the speed was very, very welcome, but the turning circle and the rudder control was just diabolically bad. I'm not sure they've finished buffing it. I have heard that they might be buffing the gun slightly. I'm not sure they need it. Maybe buff the penetration, because I, I really do feel that the penetration is a little lacking, particularly at long range. That There are just... There are too many shatters with armor-piercing at targets that you wouldn't expect to have an armor-piercing shell shatter on for me to be comfortable. Maybe if they're going to buff the guns, then buff the penetration. But in its present form, I think it's fine. I mean, yeah, okay, maybe buff the penetration of the armor piercing. But <sighs> the AP is more than good enough for decimating cruisers if you can land a solid hit. And if you are having problems with higher than average numbers of shatters on battleships at long range, then fire the high explosive. 34% chance of fire on target and <laughs> 5,300 damage. A high explosive on this ship is actually very good. So, yeah, maybe they could buff the penetration of the armor piercing, but other than that, I think the ship is fine. I'll be buying one, of course. Of course I will, it's the hood. <laughs> what, are you stupid? I'm British, I was in the Royal Navy for 22 years, of course I'm going to be buying a hood. I'm not sure which package I'm going to be buying, but I'll definitely be buying one of them. And of course, there's also the whole Hunt the Bismarck event that's coming up in World of Warships on the 19th, which, if you're watching this video on the day that it's released, is tomorrow. And if you own the hood and you start playing the Hunt the Bismarck campaign, you're going to be able to unlock things like, well, this. Battle damaged skins exclusive to the hood. They also have some for the Bismarck as well. But that's all happening tomorrow in World of Warships, or at least it's starting in World of Warships tomorrow. So, HMS Hood, premium tier 7 Admiral class battlecruiser, the last battlecruiser built for the Royal Navy. The only one of her kind. Flawed design, an example of what happens when you build a ship to fight the last war and then send it up against things like the Bismarck, which, to be completely fair, the Royal Navy didn't really have much of a choice. The Bismarck was a fast battleship, and they didn't have an awful lot that had the kind of firepower needed to sink her that was also fast enough to catch her. So that was bad news for the Hood. But it could be good news for you in World of Warships, because she is definitely not a bad ship. That's it for today. Hope you enjoyed the video, and as always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.